Good morning. My name is Michael Sneed, and I'm the Executive Vice President of Global Corporate Affairs and Chief Communication Officer at Johnson & Johnson. We are thrilled and humbled by the opportunity to sponsor this Health Equity Summit, and we are grateful for our many years of partnership with the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. At Johnson & Johnson, we are committed to helping eradicate racial and social injustice as a public health threat by eliminating health inequities for people of color. As part of that commitment, we recently announced an initiative titled Race to Health Equity. With $100 million in funding over five years, we are investing in building healthier communities, forging enduring alliances, and cultivating our own people-first culture. That's why we're so excited for today's conversations on two critical topics, the impact of COVID-19 vaccine on the Black community and mental health realities for Black America. It is conversations like these and resources like blackdoctor.org and covidvaccinefacts.org that result in stronger partnerships and lead to real change. Thank you for being here and enjoy today's dialogue. joining our first Health Equity Summit of the new year. This session is focused on learning more about the highly anticipated coronavirus vaccine and its impact on the Black community. We hope that you are able to gain an understanding of the importance of this vaccine from our nation's leading medical health care experts. Before we begin our conversation, I want to introduce Congresswoman Robin Kelly, co-chair of the CBC Healthcare Task Force and vice chair of the House Committee on Energy and Commerce. Congresswoman Kelly has spent the last year advocating for accessible and affordable COVID testing, diversity in clinical trials and widespread vaccinations. Congresswoman Kelly, thank you for being here. Good morning, everyone. And Tanya, thank you for that kind introduction and inviting me here today. I am Congresswoman Robin Kelly, and I do represent proudly the second congressional district of Illinois. And as Tanya said, I serve as the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus Health Brain Trust and a proud member of the CBCF board. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us today for this very important conversation. I'm so glad that you have taken the time out of your busy schedules to join us. First, I'd like to say that folks, we will get through this. There is finally some light at the end of the tunnel, but it is so important for us to have this discussion, not just with the purpose of persuading people in our community to take the vaccine, but to answer the serious questions they have regarding the safety and effectiveness of the vaccine. We know many people are concerned about taking the vaccine, uh, the way it was developed so quickly and also the mistrust that people have uh, that led to a lot of concerns or it leads to a lot of concerns. But it's important that scientists, uh, it's important to know that scientists across the world have worked for years on corona family viruses such as SARS and MERS to understand their method of causing infection and causing, using that knowledge to develop the vaccines that we now have. I have received both doses of the vaccine and so far, so good. I documented my experience on my social media. Many of my congressional colleagues who are of all ages and ethnicities have also received their vaccines. And those of you who are, are their constituents may have seen theirs on social media as well. As COVID-19 has shown us, politics impacts our health in ways that we often overlook in daily life. Black and Indigenous Americans continue to suffer the highest rates of loss with both groups now experiencing a COVID-19 death toll exceeding one in 750 nationally. To break it down, Pacific Islanders, Latino, Black and Indigenous Americans 
all have a COVID-19 death rate, double or more of that of white and Asian Americans who experience the lowest rates when adjusted for age. Hesitancy in the black community to take the vaccine does not come without its reasons. Because of decades of mistrust, there is a rightful mistrust of the medical research community by African Americans. As a result, we historically have low rates of uptake for vaccines, specifically for the flu, but also other vaccines more broadly. These factors show us how critical it is to have this conversation and work to address the ingrained mistrust now more than ever. But the most important way to build our trust in our communities is to expand the number of African-Americans working in the medical and biomedical research fields. Some you'll hear from today. If we have people who look like us, talking to us in our communities who are from our communities, communicating the importance of taking care of our health, we can start to build trust. I am so encouraged to be able to contribute to and welcome our panel, they're amazing, who all contribute to the health and well being of our community in their chosen fields. I hope through this conversation, we can encourage our communities to trust the vaccine and encourage those who decide to take the vaccine to serve as ambassadors to their communities. And please remember, government can only do so much. It is up to all of us to wash our hands, to wear masks, to physically distance, and to seriously consider taking the vaccine. But don't just take my word for it. Consult your primary care physician, your local pharmacist, and those who you trust to give reliable advice on medical issues. I hope this panel can provide you with the information you may not have, have had before and will help you make an informed decision about the COVID vaccine. Regardless of where you land, I thank you for being here and taking the time to listen to all of us. Remember, it will take all of us working together to get through this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Congresswoman Kelly. Um, I will now turn the conversation over to the charismatic transformational leader with 28 years of professional health and nonprofit leadership experience. Ms. Joy D. Calloway, the interim president and CEO of the Planned Parenthood of Greater New York. Thank you, Ms. Calloway, for being here. Thank you so very much, Ms. VC, for having me. I am thrilled to again be of service to the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. I love the work that you all do. I love a microphone and I love a hot topic. So this is the place for me to be this morning. And I can think of no hotter topic than the intersection of Black folks, COVID-19 and vaccination. And Rep Kelly already set the stage for me to say, I got my first shot, so I'm, I'm, I'm in line. Only thing hotter than the topic are the people that are gonna take us through the conversation today. I am thrilled to introduce to you the following. Dr. Reed Tuxen, he is the Managing Director of Tuxen Health Connections. This is a vehicle to advance initiatives that support optimal health and well-being. You'll recognize Dr. Tuxen's name most likely because of his long tenure as the Executive Vice President and Chief Med of Medical Affairs at the United Health Group. He is currently uh, serving as co-founder of the Black Coalition Against COVID. I see that acronym. Dr. Tuxen, I see that. He's a graduate of Howard Georgetown, UPenn, and Wharton. He is gonna be joined by Quita Biller Highsmith. She's the Vice President and Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer at Genentech, which is part of the Roche family. She has three decades of experience in the biotech industry. She's also co-author of several publications on healthcare disparities. So she's in the right place. She is a, an award-winning visionary and a promoter of patient inclusion. She was educated at the University of Kentucky and Cornell, welcome. Next, we have Dr. Eliseo Perez Estable. I worked so hard to say that, I love that name. He is the director of the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities uh, at the NIH. He oversees a 390.8 million, I didn't want to say 391, 390.8 million dollar budget to advance the science of minority health and health disparities. His organization is the lead organization at the National Institutes of Health for planning, reviewing, coordinating, and evaluating minority health research. His expertise spans a broad range of disciplines and he strongly promotes diversity in the biomedical research workforce. Dr. Tabia 
Henry Akintobi. She is the Professor of Community Health and Preventive Medicine. She's also the Associate Dean of Community Engagement. She's also the Principal Investigator and the Director of Prevention, the Prevention Research Center at Morehouse School of Medicine. Whew, you got a busy title there. She has demonstrated expertise in community-based participatory research, community-engaged public health practice, and experiential learning in the health professional career development uh, uh, life cycle. I believe I have now introduced all of our panelists and I'm gonna ask each of them to give us a one minute opening by answering this question. With all that's happening with COVID-19, this experience we've been in in the last year, who is your COVID-19 hero and why? Why don't we start with Dr. Tuxen? Uh, I think our hero and shero has to be the health workers who are on the front lines, uh, risking their lives every day to save people who so many of them have not been responsible about preventing this disease because of their behaviors. People that are every day putting their lives on the line. That includes the physicians, the nurses, the other health personnel, but also the sanitation workers, the environmental workers. Those are my heroes and sheroes. Thank you so much. Uh, let's hear from Ms. Beeler Highsmith. Hello. I well, I would say double uh, plus one hundred to what was just said about our healthcare workers. But also, um, we have to give a shout out to Dr. Anthony Fauci for his, <laughs> you know, his dog fast, uh, steady work um, ensuring that we had truth and knowledge um, as we were going through this pandemic. Thank you so much. Dr. perez Stable. Well, thank you for um, uh, this uh, opportunity and absolutely Dr. Fauci, but also all the NIH staff who have really been working nonstop for the last year to develop methods to uh, prevent COVID, to treat COVID, and to look at the social, behavioral, and economic consequences of this pandemic. And I'm really proud of how uh, our staff have responded. I also want to shout out to the frontline workers, the folks at the supermarket, uh, the folks who are delivering stuff to uh, individuals and those who have to go out of their home to work to earn a living. And unlike uh, many of us who can stay home and telework. So thank you. Thank you so much. And Dr. Akintobi. So ditto, 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 and ditto. I agree with all that has been shared in terms of our heroes who really are, are putting their lives on the line to ensure that we are safe. I, I would add to that, Dr. Kismikia Corbett, who helped to design the Moderna vaccine. So not only is she an immunologist at NIH, but she also is doing a lot of the important work in the conversations whether it's in churches or on Twitter. Uh, I think her role in really leading uh, and modeling uh, uh, leadership for communities of color as a vaccine designer really is exemplary and demonstrates the, the vision of what we need to see uh, representing leadership to combat COVID. Awesome, thank you so much. And the CBCF actually hosted uh, Dr. K uh, Kizmika Corbett a couple months ago. So we we're glad that you brought that name up. While you have the mic, let me first let me let folks know how we're gonna go about questions. We have some questions that were sent in ahead of time. So we're gonna work through those. I'm gonna ask two of our panelists to address each one in the time that we have about 40 minutes to work through these questions. And then we also are offering you the Q and A function in the, the, um, in the Zoom. So if you have questions, get them in there and we'll try to work in some audience questions questions as we go. Dr. Akintobi, as you have the mic, why don't you uh, help us with this one? Given that the virus is having a disproportionate impact on black and brown communities, can you speak to the importance of diversity in clinical trials? Um, and talk to us a little bit about how diverse were the trials? After you will uh, go to Dr. perez Stable on the same question. Great, so thank you for the question. And so we know that diversity in clinical trials is certainly important and um, I think one of the reasons why it's more important now more than ever is that back in, in 2019, before COVID-19 was with us, we know that Black uh, and Latinx communities were not sprinting to the front of the line to be a part of any clinical trial. And with all of the unknowns related to COVID-19, they are not running now. But we know that if communities that are disproportionately uh, affected, meaning those that are more likely to become ill, 
be hospitalized and die related to COVID-19, and those are Black, Brown, and Native communities. If they do not participate, we will not comprehensively know what works best for everyone in turning the, the curve uh, with respect to COVID-19. And so participation and representation is certainly very important. And critical to that is not just the atrocities related to inhumane uh, human engagement in research. We definitely have to continue to address that and acknowledge it. Uh, but oftentimes what we're learning in, with, in communities is that uh, people just want to understand the, the pace with which the vaccine was developed what might be some of the side effects, et cetera. So when we think about moving from hesitancy uh, to, to trust and vaccine uptake, the conversations like this one are critically important. And also us really being transparent about our own stories, right? Of either getting the vaccine or even having family members and loved ones who are, who are wrestling with this as well. So transparency, addressing the past, acknowledging the present and having safe spaces for these discussions are central to increase uptake with respect to black and brown communities participating in vaccines. Well said, and part of what I'm hearing in there is that participation in clinical trials and research for us, it's really a selfless act, it's not really about us, it's about the broader community is what I think I hear you saying. Dr. Perez Estable. Absolutely, I wanna reinforce that, that uh, most people participate in clinical studies for altruistic reasons. And, and I think this is something that's valuable to promote. So there are two main reasons to have diversity in trials. One is the social justice and demographic reality. I mean, 40% of the population is non-white today and over 50% of children are of a race ethnic minority group. So if we don't have diversity in trials, but what will we learn about the future? And the other is for scientific purposes. There may be questions that will not be uh, discoverable if we don't have diversity in our trials. Now, I'm not expecting differential responses to vaccine trials in COVID, but unless we have diversity in the study, we won't know. Uh, and there are successful um, uh, examples besides the, uh, the, the well-known uh, reasons for mistrust in, in science and research. Uh, the hypertension studies done from the 1960s uh, were heavily uh, populated by African Americans and the diabetes prevention trial in the uh, late 1990s included substantial numbers of African Americans and Latinos. So we know we can do this and do it well when it is appropriate. Thank you. Thank you. This next question is for uh, Dr. Tuxen and then Quita in that order. Um, how is uh, the medical community, the public health community, the corporate community, how are they collaborating to educate the Black community about the COVID-19 uh, vaccine and to address concerns around uh, vaccine hesitancy? Dr. Tuxen and then Quita Beeler heisman I think that what we have seen is a mosaic of multiple initiatives that are being done by a large wide variety of institutions, people and organizations. And that is very appropriate because let's remember that the black community is not homogeneic. We are heterogeneous. We have many different kinds of people who respond in many different ways based on age, education, geography, uh, occupation and so forth. So we need everybody speaking to, to, uh, to, to each segment of our community. We secondly need and are experiencing uh, the presentation of trusted voices. We are very well aware, just as you are uh, exhibiting here, that uh, our community responds well to African-American physicians and scientists. Uh, we have been from the community, we are of the community, we live in the community, uh, we grew up in the community, and the most important thing is we love the community. Everything that we do has to be driven from the point of empathy and love and compassion. And that is, in fact, what these trusted voices are doing. That being said, there's going to be, a, and we've seen special voices uh, and efforts needed by our musicians, by our athletes, um, by certainly our faith leaders. And so without belaboring it, it is a mosaic. Is that mosaic coordinated to a maximum uh, benefit? Certainly not under the Trump administration, it was not. But that doesn't matter because nobody can keep us down. We are moving forward with enlightened corporate leadership that has come to our aid. Uh, we have patched together a patchwork quilt 
And you know what? The data is showing us that that patchwork quilt is working. We are moving very rapidly away from the overall concern about vaccine hesitancy to now vaccine acceptance. In fact, as I conclude this comment, the most important thing that we are seeing is the number of African-Americans lining up to get the vaccine and the supply not being there. So I will make a fundamental message to every single person as we advocate. Do not let any local jurisdiction try to ho hook us in with some nonsense that we don't want the vaccine. Therefore, white people should be able to get our fair allotment. Just like we are seeing voter suppression, this is the fight we also have to tie in. Do not fall for the okie doke that says we don't want it because we do. Thank you. You reminded me of my childhood. Woo, don't you want to pass a hat right now and open the door? Yes. Ms. Taylor Highsmith. Yes. Well, first of all, let me thank the CBC for, for having this conversation because one of the things that we have to do is we have to have more trusted folks have the conversation so that we can build trust. And for me as a black woman, a biotech industry leader, um, I'm very concerned about COVID and what can we do about it? I know at our own organization, one of the things that we did, now we don't have a, a vaccine treatment, we have actual uh, working on treatments for COVID, is we went to the community most of the time when uh, industry does clinical research. They go to the academic center up on the big hill. And this time we were like, we need to go into the community, Jamaica, Queens in New York, go into Oakland, right? Go to where the people are because they're going to drive by that, that hospital. That's the hospital they trust. That's the hospital that they want to get their care for. So we did um, on one of our studies, where we had 84% of the population work from communities of color, Navajo Nation, Black, Hispanic. We went to Sub-Sahara Africa. And I want to I want to emphasize this because most of the time these studies go to South Africa. And we know South Africa is not Sub-Sahara Africa where our people are. And so really being intentional about where we are delivering care. And for us, we have this thing that I say at the company, if we want to engage Black people, we got to be where they are. And it's the three Bs. It's the bishop, the, so the church, the barbershop, and the beauty salon. If you want to talk to us, go there. And we've been making efforts to reach people where they are. I love that. It's right out of the handbook of the National Kidney Foundation. They were going in those uh, salons and those barbershops. My phone is blowing up. The chat is blowing up. Let me throw out one from the chat. How can we help on the same lines? How can we help? I lost it. There we go. To be ambassadors with informing the public around this literacy. You talked about a lot of different places. Now we as individuals, uh, and this is an open question. What would you say to the individuals on the line? What should I be doing today to help advance this issue? Any of the four of our guests? You know, I'll start and then, you know, somebody else can jump, jump in. Last summer, we did a study, a health equity study, where we talked to over 2,000 patients, 1,000 from the general population, and then 300 each Black, Hispanic, LGBTQ, low socioeconomic status, meaning the people make less than $35,000. And what these disenfranchised patients told us is they don't trust the system. They don't believe healthcare is empathetic. They don't believe that the health care that they seek will consider, be considerate to them. And one of the things that we all have to do is we have to speak up. If, a, if you are seeking care and you don't feel like that care is being empathetic, are they being truthful to you? You have to speak up. You have to raise your voice. You have, if, you, if you're scared, you got to bring your cousin, your grandmama, right? We have to raise our voices and not, and trust our instincts that when we feel like something is not right, probably something's not right. And so raising our voice and being bold and speaking up is going to be critical. I, I appreciate that, Kuda. I, I would add to that, that there are efforts given the space that we're in that people really can use to raise their voices. So the national issue right now is that communities of color are ready, but the system is not. So in terms of what Morehouse School of Medicine has been doing as a, as a member and leader for the Community Engaged Alliance to fight COVID, 
We developed vaccine Saturdays for the community. And of course, this was in collaboration with our, our state health department. Um, within two days of having civil rights out icons to talk about and model that behavior, these were the super seniors, we had 1,800 individuals who wanted to be vaccinated. And we were able to, to address eight, uh, 1,700 of them. And by a couple of weeks ago, we have 9,000 people who are on that waiting list. So to Dr. Tuxen's point, they are ready. And so at this time, when we think about raising voices, it's critical for you all to, to, to uh, develop letters based on your advocacy groups to your state health department. Uh, to really debunk this, this myth right now that communities of color are not ready. They are ready and the system must be ready to meet the demand. So we know the system was not perfect before, but in light of unusual times, there have to be unusual and unique responses. So they should certainly be, be talking with their state health departments. And I would also say the National COVID Resilience Network, you can type in NCRN that Morehouse leads, it's a national initiative and certainly within your region, we would love to have you participate in efforts to address COVID. We want to hear and raise your voices. And that's one way that you can also do that. But you know, Joy, I would add to that real quickly is uh, in addition, and I love the comments, raising our voices, we have to raise our vision. You know, we are so stuck in the amber of Tuskegee. We have got to get past that. There is almost in our community a a joyfulness at being attacking innovation. How come it happened so fast? What's going on here? Who's doing what? I don't trust this. I don't trust that. You know, remember one thing. When we get upset about the Tuskegee syphilis study, it was a study that was so outrageous because people with a disease were denied access to treatment. Let's don't do that to ourselves. You know, we are so stuck in being pissed off that we don't allow ourselves to look up over the horizon and embrace science and embrace technology. And the second thing we have to do as individuals as we raise our vision is to stop the conspiracy theory cycle. We keep on falling prey to the white supremacist messages, the Russian bots, all of those things that permeate our social media. We have got to decide now that we're gonna cut the cord and go to trusted science, go to Morehouse, go to blackdoctor.org where the trusted information is. We at the Black Coalition Against COVID are putting together an editorial board of all four of our black medical schools, the NMA and the National Black Nurses. They will be supervising all of the content on COVID on the blackdoctor.org site, trusted sources. So I will end it with by clearly saying again, we have to raise our voices, but we have to raise our vision and look to the future and, and learn to embrace science, study it, but don't get caught in the amber of 1930 Tuskegee experience. This is not the same world that existed then. I swear I'm gonna break out my organ any minute. I'm gonna break <laughs> out my organ and get these cords in. To that point though, doc, this did take, and I, I, I respect that point. I think it's a good one. I hope people are taking notes. But to that point, this did happen awful quickly. We've got a lot of diseases out there that they are still trying to find a vaccine, a cure. They're still, how did this happen so quickly? We were very lucky, Joy. We were very lucky in this case that when we had the experience with SARS and with um, uh, uh, Ebola and all of those kinds of things that happened in the recent past, the world science community, and this point was made earlier, the world science community realized that we were caught flat footed. So what did they do? We put in a worldwide surveillance system that made sure that we could track these viruses as they are developing early on. We have a new set of genomic capabilities that allowed us within one week of identifying this unusual virus to decode the entire genome over the first week of January. We had produced a precursor vaccine, a, a standard factory shell of the mRNA that was available. Then we could be able to reprogram that. So what we are seeing is the benefit of a lot of work that happened years ago heavy investment in new innovation and science that give us this unprecedented new miracle. So instead of our being concerned about it, I think we've got to learn to embrace what the humanity has been able to achieve in the last few years. I, I wanna reinforce what uh, Dr. Tuxton just said. And much of this was done at NIH through the Vaccine Research Center in collaboration with other scientists across the world and, and from uh, industry. And this is not a miracle in six months. 
This has been years of investment in basic research that led to uh, having this platform of messenger RNA vaccine, which will work for viruses, will not work for perhaps you know, bacteria and other kinds of vaccines, but will work for viruses and was a product of the SARS, the uh, epidemic and the Ebola. And so the scientists were primed to do this and then being able to uh, stabilize the delivery of the spike protein so that it actually is, is a very innovative way of programming our body to produce the antibodies to protect us from this virus. And just imagine it's 95% effective compared to the flu, flu vaccines, usually at best 70%. Uh, this is like a measles vaccine for something new. So it, it is a remarkable advancement. And I think that our community, uh, our communities of color need to lead in promoting uh, trusted scientific information. And the best representatives of that are your local nurses, local doctors, and, and local healthcare workers, uh, not necessarily the, uh, the media stars, in, in my opinion. So we definitely have to get ourselves out of that thinking that this happened quickly. Yes, we built upon past knowledge. It may have happened quickly in some of our minds, but this has been a long time coming. Thank you for clarifying that. Again, my, my, between the phone and the chat, here's one. What resources are there to support uh, uh, initiatives in literacy and hesitancy for those, who, for those for whom English is their second language? Not all black and brown people speak English as their primary language. So what are we doing to work through that? There is We're going to start there for me. There, there's extensive uh, support for Spanish language materials uh, that have been developed from the very beginning on the NIH website. I'm sure that Dr. Uh, Tabia Henry is also uh, doing this through the Morehouse Center and the Office of Minority Health, and Dr. Tuxen has done this as well. So, uh, Spanish is the most common uh, language spoken by those who do not speak English well. There are other uh, languages as well, particularly Asian uh, languages or French uh, for some groups. So uh, those are harder to develop as quickly, but we're all working on it. I, I would say, just adding to what Dr. Staba said, we, through the, the Community Engaged Alliance Against COVID, are actually curating a lot of the existing uh, COVID messaging, whether it's mass media, social media, et cetera. I'm gonna put another link in the chat. So we are reviewing it to ensure community relevance um, and, and responsiveness. But those that are, are ready for the public are those that I'll share in the chat. And they're in every language and they're in everything uh, from flyers all the way through social media. You can use these and adapt in your community. So someone just said, what about Creole for Haitians? I will put the link in there and, and use what works best for you and you can adapt it and let us know what needs to be changed because we want to be sure that it's community responsive and culturally sensitive. Thank you so much. I, I would just want to add to this one thing. I, I think one of the things that, you know, while we're trying to bring people in, we also need the government to help us because there is a question um, asking people, are you a U.S. citizen to get the vaccine? Why do you need to know that? Hmm. That is not relevant. If you are in the country, if you're going to get the vaccine, just get the vaccine. Why are you answering unnecessary questions? Because that might steer people off to, from getting vaccinated when we need everyone to move forward with the, with the vaccination. So we need to ensure that the government, we need to let our our, our legislators know that that's inappropriate. Thank you very much. Here's one that I think I'd like to offer. Um, we know we talk a lot about some of the metropolitan areas, but we do have many rural areas and communities around the country that have black and brown folks in them. What is being done in those communities um, to increase the rollout and to do more of what we're doing right now, dispelling the myth? We're, all of you all are from major metropolitan areas. What are we doing in the rural communities? Open question to any of our uh, panelists. Well, I would, I would point out that the, the two states that have done the best in getting uh, needles into arms have been West Virginia and Alaska, uh, which are two uh, more, rural, more rural states because they were organized. So we're aware of this. I think that um, some of it relates on the vaccine, how much cold chain is needed for the vaccine. For example, the Pfizer vaccine needs to be at very cold temperatures. The uh, Moderna vaccine needs to be at uh, freezer, minus 20 degrees centigrade temperature. But the, the Johnson, uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccine will, will, not, will just need regular refrigerator. 
uh, once that is approved and distributed as a one dose vaccine may represent a better alternative for very remote areas that will not have access to these refrigerated uh, um, technologies. Other thoughts on that one? The other thing that I will just say, uh, you know, we at Genentech uh, through our foundation have given about 42 million um, to help with uh, the, some of the, of the digital divide because a lot of times in order to get the appointment for the vaccine, you've got to be able to go online, you've got to be able to refresh your browser and all of that. And, and this is not necessarily rural, but it's low, more low income. And so it is often more challenging for us who don't have the best Apple computer, the best technology, the latest iPhone to be able to have access to the internet and, and having access to the internet is a critical component to getting that appointment. So I do think industry, like businesses, we need to be thinking about ways that we can help our communities so that they can participate um, and have the resources they, that they need in order to um, get vaccinated. Absolutely. And I think as we've heard that this uh, this pandemic and this whole vaccine rollout, it's just showing us what we all learned, the social determinants of health. We're seeing it all being amplified. So we have to address this from so many different levels all at the same time. Dr. Akintoba, you opened your mic. Oh, I was just, I wanted to give a, a, a an intentional shout out to federally qualified health centers. They are charged with serving individuals who represent the COVID profile in every part of, of every state and particularly in rural um, um, locations in the state. So they, uh, in the state of Georgia and many other places, they have uh, community health workers and other liaisons who really work with those in rural communities. They go to the community, we partner with them strategically because they have that reach to rural areas that we do not. I would also recommend engaging with your state's rural health association because again, that is their charge to reach those that are harder to reach. Um, and they certainly have the trust and we all wanna make sure that we continue to be eligible of the community's trust. So consider those as, as great champions when we think about heroes, but also great partners, rural health associations in, in just about every state. We are continuing to get really good fodder in our um, our chat panel. If Dr. Tuxton was taking us to church, then Chandra Crawford is taking us right back to the School of Public Health. She says she's agreed with everything we're saying. Uh, however, she wanted to point out that this distrust in the black and brown communities is not just about uh, Tuskegee. It's not just about Henrietta Lacks. And she's given us several articles about what's happening right now around pain care in black communities, lower quality health services, biases toward treatment, black and brown folks. Experts, what do we do about that today? In any order? I think that it's uh, an important point and let us make sure that we clearly do understand. We can keep two different thoughts in our mind at the same time. On the one hand, we are very well aware that the seeds of distrust have been deeply planted inside of our community and our collective culture. And those seeds of distrust are watered every day by our interaction with the criminal justice system, police departments, the political infrastructure of this country, the finance system, and of course, the healthcare system. So we do understand those things. You can separate that and be upset with that, and, and but we can also make a decision that also says that when we have been fighting for our lives all these years, since we've been in America, overcoming all of these challenges every day to continue to grow our families and, and grow our lives, that we also can latch on to the things that are necessary to keep us alive, to help us to survive, like these sorts of vaccines. While we are doing those two things, we have to continue to hold the healthcare system accountable for its behavior every day in every way. That is work that we have always been doing and we have more to do. We have to hold the system accountable just as we have held the criminal justice system accountable. It is amazing to me though that the um, that when, when I was commissioner of health in DC during the height of the AIDS epidemic in the 1980s, the number one risk factor that limited us in fighting that fight was Tuskegee. Today, 40 years later, the same risk factor, Tuskegee and all the other things. The fact that our healthcare uh, research and community, our healthcare delivery system and our healthcare policy system has done absolutely nothing 
to take away that distrust over all of these years and is not prepared, it seems, to do even enough to be able to make sure that it doesn't happen for the next pandemic, which is sure to come a few years from now. So this is an indictment on all of the healthcare system in the United States, and we have to continue to hold them accountable and be working with them to change. However, let us again remember, we can be upset and angry, but we can also reach for the life preserver when it is thrown to us. It doesn't make any sense to be pissed off and not take the life preserver when it is sent to you. I, 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 I wanted to add to that, that besides vaccines, treatment, early treatment is important. Uh, and if you're distrusting the healthcare system and don't seek care now when you have symptoms, you may end up with a worst case of COVID. And we are seeing uh, the symptoms are quite broad, nonspecific, like a flu symptom. And I think urge everyone to make sure you consult with a healthcare professional about symptoms early on and don't let that mistrust uh, prevent that. Thank you. Dr. Akintobe. Yeah, so we must acknowledge the past. We must continue to unpack it as issues of it emerge. And they, I don't think we'll ever, we will ever stop having to have those conversations. And now what? While we are dying, getting sick, and hospitalized related to this pandemic, what do we do? We, we've heard that we must hold the system that, that is broken accountable, and we must be the change that we want to see. So this panel is an example of the importance of us making sure that we as leaders representing Black and Brown research and public health, we are eligible of the community's trust. That is why I see points of light. When we have 9,000 people who are in line, we know there are systems barriers, but that means that trust has been built, right? People are ready. So we must acknowledge that we are the change that we should expect and that the conversations and trust that we are modeling and intend to build are making a difference. So the system and the life preserver are important, but we also must represent that. The other thing that I will add, it, and we have to be thinking about the future, we have to be thinking about who's the pipeline of talent that is going to be the next doctor, the next scientist, the next researcher, and how are we funding? Because it's a lot of money to spend eight years in medical school and to get a PhD in biology. How are we funding this next generation? Because that when we see each other, if I have a black doctor or there's a black scientist working on something, it's it, they're gonna have more understanding. The other thing I think we must do is we must um, teach at, at medical schools the, the impact of racism. What is the impact of racism on my health? And then for the person, the, the academic, the researcher, how are they learning about racism and what that has done and what that has not done? I feel like we are missing a lot of the institutional things that we need to do to change the conversation. I have to mute myself whenever any of you all are talking because I'm like, mm -hmm, yes, I know it for real. I'm writing notes. I hope people are taking notes of th these are nuggets of gold of platinum that are being shared. And I hope that everybody that is part of this experience, all 936 of you are making notes about, about what you can specifically do to get more black and brown people vaccinated in your community, in your family, in your circle of love and influence. Here's a question that someone texts me. What what are some actionable steps for white people slash medical professionals, the medical community to address concerns in a meaningful way? How can non-black and brown folks in the community be helpful? I'd like all of you all to address that in your own way. Well, I think speaking truth uh, and being scientific in the approach, regardless of your color uh, and how you look is important to communities. I mean, this has been true as a clinician. Uh, it was never a problem as long as one was, you know, transparent, direct, and and spoke in 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 uh, in terms that the people can understand. No, it's talking the medical jargon or talk about science too much detail about the, the 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 scientific detail that we talk to each other and convince each other about the data. Once you have a conclusion about a, an an intervention. 
then really promote it. And I think people will be able to detect that um, sincerity uh, and, and, and accept it. Although, you know, you have to go out and do it. You have to be, say, oh, I'm, not, I'm the wrong color. I can't go into that community. That's not true. That is just not the case. One of the things that we have really learned from this pandemic is that it's shown a bright light on the relationship between one person and the society in which they live. Our obligation as individuals to the people around us, the people we share our time and space, whether we wear a mask because we care about other people or whether we don't, whether we, our own narcissistic sense of ourselves is more powerful than whether we can sicken or kill another person. So these interrelationships are important. If there are, there are so many well-meaning white people in this country, and what we have to be able to now have is that when you see thousands and thousands and thousands of black people take to the city streets all around the country and declare, my life matters, I, my dignity is important, you must respect who I am, we need to have those well-meaning people coming and joining, whether figuratively or literally. But we have to be able to have in this country everybody saying, we understand, leaving out the political nonsense, the political football, the polarization. It is really ultimately a matter of whether or not we treat each other with humanity. And so I would just urge every single person who is white, who cares, you know, Black people can't solve racism. You know, we, we can have this conversation a thousand times. Y'all got to have a conversation among y'all selves and y'all need to deal with this. We're not the problem. And so, you know, let us make ask you, those of you who care, talk to your friends. Y'all need to cool yourselves out while we continue to do our fight. Meanwhile, let's remember we are, if we've learned anything from this pandemic, one human family. We're all stuck together and there is no way out of it. We are inextricably tied as Martin Luther King said, but let's remember always, this is about respect for humanity. We all need to be a part of these discussions. Uh, justice, income inequality, all of the things that lead to health disparities that are exacerbated by COVID, they require all of us to be a part of the discussion. So I found that the, the panels that have probably been uh, most meaningful have been those that have included uh, those who look like me, but also those who don't. I think, again, when people um, sense sincerity mixed in with the science and also acknowledgement of, of how what they represent might be a part of the problem, as well as the solution, those are probably the most uh, meaningful discussions that happen. So it takes all of us. All of us must speak truth to power and acknowledge uh, the disparities that exist. So all of us need to be a part of these discussions. And the one thing about uh, uh, COVID, it has democratized things like Zoom where we can actually see each other and see who is who. Uh, and so the opportunity to use these forums to have all, everyone represented uh, with the same message uh, is very important. And, and I will just add, you know, right now we all talking about this we in this moment, everybody's talking about, it, but when we get vaccinated and we get outside the house and we back out to dinner and we are traveling and we are on vacation, let's not forget all of what has happened. Let's keep the conversation going. This has to be a movement, a movement around driving race and health equity because I'm very concerned that after we get back outside and we not, are no longer on Zoom and we're not stuck in a house, everybody's gonna go back to normal and not have the discussions that we're having now. So let's make sure that we stay proactive, that we stay intentional and that we keep this front and center. That was a perfect entree into what it looks like is gonna be our last group question. I'm feeling like Dougie Fresh, uh, so you know how much time we have left. The question is, with the COVID-19 vaccine now available, we've, we're educating, we're kind of rebranding, we're marketing. What does recovery from this pandemic look like for black and brown people? What does rural, real recovery look like? I'd like all of you all to answer that in your own manner. Well, I'll take, I'll go first. Um, I think that we all will acknowledge that life has changed. Uh, we can do so much more from distance now. And I don't foresee that we'll be back to normal work, uh, being back in the workspace in a year uh, fully. And, and so that's one thing. Um, second, I think that we're all going to be more careful about being exposed to other people breathing uh, that you don't, you're not sharing uh, space with all the time. 
So mask wearing will be more frequent, particularly in crowded or indoor spaces. Uh, and we're much more careful uh, about, about that exposure. Um, we do, do need to address, uh, this has been brought up, uh, the structural inequalities that have been so obvious uh, as a consequence of this pandemic. And I, uh, from our perspective at NIH uh, and the scientific community and hopefully the clinical community will begin to address this uh, more rigorously. Uh, it will require involvement of more than the healthcare sector. It will in involve uh, economic opportunity, educational quality, uh, you know, addressing the nutritional uh, challenges that our communities face, as well as safety and criminal justice issues that we're also sensitized to, and the issues around uh, transportation and other infrastructures. So uh, we look forward to the, using this, leveraging this crisis to really advance uh, the agenda for our communities. This morning, there was a report that uh, Black folk in the U.S. lost almost three years of life expectancy in the first half of 2020. And Latinos uh, lost almost two years of life expectancy in the first half of 2020. We're losing ground in an area that we had actually made progress in the last two decades. So I think that uh, we need to really uh, focus on, on the big picture and on the small issues uh, going forward. Thank you so much. Recovery That's means if, uh, in, big, in big part, it's gonna mean, uh, first of all, whether or not we continue to be the, the exemplars of wearing our masks physical distancing, hand washing, and all the fundamentals, and not being caught inside of bars and nightclubs and restaurants where this thing will spread. And it me recovery means that we will have been the ones who have gotten extraordinary amounts of vaccine into our body so that we stop the spread. And here's why I'm particularly concerned. As the rest of the country recovers, the, the doors will open up, schools will open up, bars will open up, the cities will open up. And if we are left behind, we're going to wind up being exposed again and again. We don't forget about the mutations that are circling around, mutations that are more uh, uh, prevalent to be able to spread from person to person and may be more dangerous. And so what I am really fearful of is a nation moving forward, then they open up the doors and we're going out to do the essential work to drive the buses, clean the streets, be the retail workers. And guess what happens? It comes right back on us again and cycles and cycles. Brothers and sisters, we have got to be the examples of doing all the right stuff and fighting like heck to get this vaccine so that we can get back to our lives. Recovery is not a given unless we fight. Here's what I think recovery should look like. It should look like promoting local community leadership to proactively inform mitigation strategies. And I don't mean mitigation strategies just for COVID. Remember, there was Zika, there was H1. COVID is just the one we're in right now. So when we think about recovery, we need to think about what we've learned and how it moves us and prepares us for what will be next. It also means that public health uh, uh, professionals should be engaged with community attuned policy leaders. They should be working and playing together so that the system that is broken uh, can be developed with community leadership in mind. And I wanna say this, it's so very important. We must foster culturally tailored behavioral and mental health dialogue and response. We've not talked about it during this discussion, but we cannot uh, ignore the mental and behavioral health realities that COVID has exacerbated, particularly in communities of color. Our new normal must take what we've learned and prepare for what will be next. Excellent. Quita, any I, closing I comments? Yeah, I, just, I know we only have a minute left. I, I would say for recovery, we have to be incubating a diverse workforce, right? Like the, the reality on recovery is you got to have some money. And the way to have some money is by being um, fully employed in the workforce. And we need to be driving strategies around ensuring that we're including communities of color um, and that there are policies in place to ensure that we are represented in the workplace. Quita, Dr. Akintobi, Dr. Tuxon, Dr. perez Stable, I am full. I am full and I had already met you all and got a little of your fire. I can only imagine what everybody on the line is feeling like. Thank you, thank you, thank you. A million thanks um, for this. Uh, uh, there are no words to thank you. Some housekeeping. Um, there will be a sharing of the video after this. There is a session to Dr. Akintobi's point. There is a session at two o'clock on mental and emotional health. 
um, in the pandemic. Um, let's see, the session will be posted on YouTube. A link will be available on the policy for the people um, landing page. And there is one final slide. Thank you guest speakers for allowing me to serve you. Thank you, CBCF, for allowing me to serve. Thank you, all of you, for being here. Thank Have you so much. Thank you. This was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.